The cult favorite Zombies Ate My Neighbors for both the Super NES and the Genesis, with the latter being a direct port of the former, by the combined efforts of the still-thriving Konami and the ill-fated LucasArts circa 1993. start kicking things off as usual, I'd like to give a few shoutouts. First and foremost, to Brooklyn Interactive Group and Somerville Media Center, Ian Bergeson from 16-Bit Heroes and the Offseason, Macaulay Culkin, care of BunnyEars.com, Chris Bennett, aka the Mount Vernon Kid, Autumn Lee Bales, aka Old School Gamer Mama, from Gatlinburg, Tennessee, Matt Lister from Dover, New Hampshire, James Rolfe and Mike Matsay from Cinemassacre, Matt Michael and Sarah Rose Stone from Clovis, California, Trevor Shrum from Fort Morgan, Colorado, Greg White from Boonville, New York, Joe Walker, aka Space Kappa, and his wife Christina, from Medford, and finally, Jamie Billings, aka the Unicorn Princess, from Brooklyn, New York. With these out of our skulls, onto this game's main premise. A mad scientist by the name of Dr. Tongue has conceived and reanimated all sorts of different monsters, most of which are based on and or inspired by B-horror and other horror-related elements, thereby unleashing them on the masses of our beloved Earth. Now its fate rests within the hands, and the insanely vast arsenal of weapons, of two unlikely kids, Zeke and Julie, no damn it, not that Julie, to rid the world, not just their local turf of course, of this mishmash army of undead and demonic beings. In terms of gameplay, much more than just your boilerplate top view run and gun romp, a kit to Stern Electronics Berserk, the ill-fated Midway, and Williams Electronics Total Carnage and Smash TV respectively, SNK Playmore's Ikari Warriors franchise, Rainbow 3 on Genesis, you name it. You're taking control of one or two of the aforementioned main 3D goggled geek slash teeny bopper duo, making every effort possible to rescue all the human victims, be they cheerleaders, photo crazy tourist couples, barbecue chefs, wandering infants, dogs despite them being animals, hunters, explorers, pool inner tubers, trampling girls, or bitchy hag teachers awarding you an F, while keeping every, and I mean every, relentless pursuer and or assailant at bay. The assortment of weapons, as limited as they are, especially the infinitely ample holy water-filled squirt guns, are feasible for making them your forever bitches everywhere you traverse. Others include explosive soda cans, and fuck no it's not beer, popsicles, tomatoes, silverware and dishes, bazookas, fire extinguishers, alien-crafted bubble blasters, ancient artifacts including Pandora's box, which of course counts as an item, and a crucifix that resembles the cross of Coronado no less, flamethrowers only available in the SNES version, weed whackers, and the like. Believe me, you'll need each and every last one of them if you're to stand any chance against the endless terror-inducing adversaries. When attempting to rescue every victim, be sure not to let any opposing goon get near them, or it's their asses, and eventually yours if all 10 victims get sacrificed, thereby resulting in a game over, of course. <laughs> In regards to the control setup, both versions involve the usual on-ground movement via your D-pad. Of course, you can also use it to aim in any direction you desire, while LNR toggles the victim radar to keep track of how many need to be saved, but only in the SNES version. The Genesis version, however, provides the radar at all times, along with the rest of the UI details to the right. By default, the SNES version, which has absolutely no option mode unlike the Genesis, involves Y and B having your character deploy and swap around their weapons at will, with X and A having your character use up and swap their special items at will, individually, the latter of which I'll get to in no time. The Genesis version, however, carries out these same commands depending on which type of controller you've got plugged in. For instance, if you've got a 3-button controller jacked in, you can swap weapons around by holding A and pushing B, or swap the items around by holding A down and pushing C. B and C alone let your character deploy their weapon and use up their special items, respectively. Or if you've got a 6-button controller jacked in, A and X deploys and swaps around your character's weapons at will, while B and Y uses up and swaps their special items at will, respectively. Apart from the gargantuan-ass mishmash selection of weapons, there are special items at their disposal, not just keys for opening doors, gates, and chests, and first aid kits for instant life recovery, of course. 
There's also three types of potions, one in red that transforms you into an unstoppable as shit purple werewolf that makes even Razor from Turtles 2 The Secret of the Ooze, Manhattan Project, and Turtles in Time look like scrappy fucking do. One in yellow with a question mark emblazoned on it that results in a random effect. Whether it's causing damage to yourself, replenishing health like the first aid kits, the aforementioned werewolf transformation, turbo speed, temporary zombification, what have us. And one in blue that'll transform you into a ghost for a brief period of time, just like the red potion. Except you can't attack for dick or leap on a trampolines despite being temporary early immune speed choose for who could have fucking guessed turbo sprinting abilities inflatable clown decoys for distracting your attackers and even skeleton keys for opening skull doors and castles and other cursed areas all of which i strongly suggest conserving for even the most crucial situations and ditto for the weapons against who are these lethal ass pursuers in question we're confronting one might ask aside from the titular brain-eating zombie dildos whom obviously you'll be striving to keep off your ass every which way they're various psychotic evil killer tommy dolls step aside chucky werewolves mummies chainsaw maniacs by the name of stanley decker aka whom i like to call the bastard love children of jason Voorhees and leatherface pot plants in their surrounding poisonous roots exact duplicate alien doppelganger clones of zeke and or julie vampires christ where's david and his blood one when you need him toxic jelly blobs martians jockass jerkweed football players frankenstein clones lagoon creatures aka squid men or gill men living mushroom men tentacles and giant ants both in black and red not to mention the fearsome mini and main boss altercations involving the following fiendish fuckbaits the ravenous rampaging and milk spewing giant infant referred to as the quote-unquote titanic toddler adam solinsky from honey i blew up the kid meet your new preschool partner ufos controlled by martians that unleash one electric beam after another ack 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 indeed brooding underground swarms of snakeoids aka the gigantic green worms price tremors much okay i've got to stop with the reference spewing here and finally the giant red and black striped spider followed by dr tongue himself reincarnated as nothing more than just his goddamn giant noggin now trust me when I say this shit, with the exception of the commonplace, wimpy-ass boilerplate adversaries, unless you're fully stocked with as many weapons as possible and hardwired with the most advantageous evasion and item conservation tech to confront all the others, they'll do way more than tempt you to douse both your face and controller in a tub of hydrogen peroxide while singing Megadust's Angry Again and Murrayhead's One Night in Bangkok in a mishmashy Ferengi Klingon Koira Chini Iwaki Simlish fusion dialect. Upon rescuing all 10 victims, or less, as long as one or two of them are saved, and optionally racking up other necessary weapons and or items, it's on to the next area, and well, you pretty much get the entire kit and caboodle ball of wax routine. Regarding the bonus areas, most of them can be accessed depending on your overall progress in saving and sparing all 10 lives of every unsuspecting human victim in each area without letting any of them get lynched before reaching the 12th stage, Mars needs cheerleaders. While the straightforward controls are nothing short of flexible, the overall gameplay scope and framework can agitate many a neophyte, especially in the 4th stage and onward, thanks to not only the sometimes bewildering maze-like structures, but also the excessive abundance of enemy altercations in which you'll frequently immerse yourself, hence where our next topic comes in, while attempting to save all the victims, or better yet, stocking up on more weaponry and key items to further your crucial penultimate goal. In spite of said downside, however, there's no denying that the ability to work your way the hell around this and other downsides is nothing short of beneficial and within one's grasp. Ditto for the earlier recounted gameplay scope, about which I have no clear-cut intention of spewing any horseshit whatsoever. Regarding Zombies Ate My Neighbors Challenge, if you're willing to, feel free to refer back to what I took up about some of the key strategies in terms of conserving and managing every weapon and item for crucial situations, which I'm in no goddamn position to reiterate. Apart from these, whenever you enter any house to look for said items in each motherfucking cupboard or cabinet, or behind curtains and castles, under piles of sand and pyramids and deserted areas, I'd be careful if I were you, as one of them may contain a random blob that appears out of nowhere unexpectedly. Ow! Shit, talk about your number one fuckboys. Looking at you, Mr. Baffa Cake. In addition, the fluctuating multitude of stages contain unprecedented areas of environmental and maze-like features, which of course, you'll always adapt to every step of the goddamn way, including the trampolines and even bodies of water including pools and rivers no less. Not to mention those previously alluded enemy altercations, most of which will drive your ass straight up the walls of fucking Constantinople faster than a goddamn excavation machine and a construction elevator combined. 
Case in point, who could forget those inexorable as shit Jason and Leatherface's bastard children chainsaw maniacs in stage 4 and onward, always on the prowl for your desperate ass, taking hits like champs, and while they are beneficial for sawing off portions of the hedge maze, they are always liable to send the asses of the unsuspecting victims you are seeking to rescue home in a fucking box, and yours especially if you are not careful, let alone the perpetual spawning areas of certain foes, including and of course, it doesn't just involve the token zombies, but also those goddamn living Tommy dolls, both untouched and engulfed in flames, those fucking giant black and red ants, and miscellaneous other adversaries from which you are better off fleeing like a wuss. And as ever, for the love of Christ, don't even get me started with random and speed dating boss confrontations either, especially those aforementioned giant infants, snakeoids, UFOs controlled by Martians, and other insidious, ass gaping, filth devouring, bastard porking, jizz and shit regurgitating, ocular cavity puking, piss ant sons of bitches that'll make you curse and rue the very moment you've even dared to confront the fuck out of them. Thus, here's my two tier checklist of solutions for preventing any recurring conflict stemming from these barriers, which I more than vigorously suggest taking under advisement. Not that Zombies Ate My Neighbors is the hardest, as opposed to the other sanity raping titles most of us have experienced at one point or another. First and foremost, memorization, and to be more concise, familiarity and or knowledge of not only how to traverse through each area and to spare the lives of each victim safely, but also which weapons to use against each opposing assailant, no matter how resilient they are. And secondly, trial and error. In other words, working one's way around said run-throughs and or confrontations while avoiding the same constant fuck-ups, notwithstanding how often they'll take effect. Also, another hint to take into account, according to IGN of course, should you happen to miss a single victim in any given stage due to their inadvertent sacrifice by on-ground adversaries, hence that aforementioned radar which I strongly suggest referring back to, you can actually win some of them back as bonuses upon earning the highest possible score, thereby replacing said inadvertently sacrificed victims and working your total count back up to the starting maximum of 10. Besides those, starting off with 3 lives and absolutely no continues whatsoever, there's a password system in which a 4 digit letter based code will pop up upon passing every 4th stage, despite the sudden exclusion of a potential saving system, which tragically, LucasArts was more than unable to implement during development. Other than that, these passwords can either be written down or looked up on the web for easier reference. However, you'll always end up continuing in a previously embarked area with dick all, in which case, you'd have to stock up on items and weapons again from the ground up every Christ forsaken time. I mean, what the hell kind of irksome ass bullfuck is that, right? Last minute advice set in stone, bear this and other words to the wise in mind while doing the same for every key strategy despite the ignominious repercussions this game carries. While they're not in any way mind blowing, let alone much the cream one's knickers over nowadays, the graphical capabilities of both versions are sights for sore ass eyes, even after more than one quarter of a century, despite the hues of the Genesis version being rather limited. All the main and opposing characters alike, including Zeke and Julie themselves, and the mishmashy cast of both the clueless string and static bystanders, and the menacing undead and demonic motherfuckers with whom they encounter no matter where or how far they roam, have been meticulously, albeit comically fabricated and enlivened to an unimaginable result, hence the ever so tempting B-movie and parody styles that Mike Ebert and his accomplices were striving to go for. The overhead interior and exterior background designs, most notably those of all the gardens, yards, streets, department stores and malls, factories, pyramids, deserts, stadiums and everything in between, are far from atrocious, and while they intended to opt out of making any apocalyptic element look too realistic in favor of that humorous parody angle I was implying, including the moment when the attackers sacrificed one of the neighbors, thus transforming them into ghastly angels, I have a firm, unbreakable conviction that the folks at LucasArts made that objective work to their advantage. It should also go without noting that one of the bonus stages was named after and inspired by another LucasArts title, Day of the Tentacle, hence the second Maniac Mansion installment, released that very same year, and that the game over screen's colors are different, purple for the SNES and red for the Genesis, in reference to both ooze and blood respectively, with the latter maintaining the console's hardcore status. I mean, take MK and Blades of Vengeance for example, but I digress. <laughs> As far as music and sound, orchestrated by the combined efforts of Joe McDermott of Cubert 3, Indy Car Racing, Putt Putt Saves the Zoo, Pajama Sam 3, This Means War, and the 7th Guest Fame, alongside George Sanger, aka the Fat Man of Home Alone, Maniac Mansion, Funhouse, Defenders of Dinatron City, another LucasArts classic, and the 11th Hour Fame amongst many, with a Genesis version rearranged by Eric Swanson of Captain America and the Avengers on Super NES and Game Gear fame, based on Data East's original concept, Quest for the Shaving Axe starring Ren Hoke and Stimpy on Game Gear, Beavis and Bud Head, Warlock, Metal Warriors, and Ah Real Monsters fame, alongside the aforementioned Fat Man, while the concurrent themes of both versions sound the exact same while correlating to the intended overall mood, they're all encapsulated to one pivotal factor personal taste. In comparison to the dynamic, high calibrated, and much celebrated capabilities of the Super NES, no rhyme intended, 
Those of its Genesis counterparts, while granted, can turn off many a curious consumer due to its limited and oversimplified channels, are still on the up and up, albeit caustic at times. Nothing against Swanson. As part of cultivating the horror overtones, and considering that they tend to recycle in between each chain of stages, each and every theme heard throughout contains something of an eccentric genese quoi, fused with suspenseful components, reminiscent of Ira Newborn, the late Richard Stone, Bruce Broughton, Bruce Arnson, Randy Eagleman, and others. But here I am once more getting WAY TOO MOTHERFUCKING AHEAD OF MYSELF. The sound effects, while unnerving to some, are always a hoot to attach oneself to time and time again. Not only the creepy laughs in the SNES version Zombie Panic, but a few of the voice samples, including the screams of any bystander when they meet their untimely fate, when your character takes damage, the laughter coming from the killer dolls, and the werewolf's continuous howls. Not to mention the stereotypical occurrences, in terms of the item, weapon, and victim acquisitions, weapon deployments, chainsaw buzzes, the light of which serves as a sign of urgency, ditto for the aforementioned werewolf howls, and not surprisingly, don't clash too severely with the songs. And before I go any further, my top 5 favorite songs are as follows Zombie Panic for Stage 1, No Assembly Required, also heard in Stage 3, Terror Now 5, The Boss Battle Theme, first heard in Stage 4, Chainsaw Hedge Maze Mayhem, Weird Kids on the Block, first heard in the title sequence at the beginning, reused in Stage 5, and finally Pyramid of Fear Stage 6, with an honorable mention aimed toward Curse of the Tongue Stage 7. Lastly, regarding the replayability, need I say any goddamn more about the simultaneous two-player madcap massacre-laden mayhem, the overwhelmingly ample as fuck supply of weapons necessary to combat every formidable fiend imaginable, pop culture references, hidden secrets, and the sanity-pillaging difficulty this often battled about, offbeat yet intense, and addictive as Super Silver Haze cult favorite has to offer? Even if you're not much of a film buff like yours truly and a few others, Zombies Ain't My Neighbors will keep you guessing and coming back time and time and time again for more surprises in ways that most of us couldn't even bring ourselves to fathom, and then some. Bottom line, consider yourself non goddamn compass mentis to even think of heartlessly neglecting this title. And before I forget, there's an SNES-only sequel, despite the aforementioned Ebert and his team of designers intending otherwise, released by JVC and not Konami the following year, Ghoul Patrol, which from what I hear, was an absolute fucking hot mess of a letdown, not to mention a PS1 and Saturn Greek mythology-themed prequel known as Herx Adventures, which was the exact fucking opposite. Henceforth, what's my final verdict? There are absolutely no words to express how much I recommend the ever-loving shit out of Zombies Ate My Neighbors, as most of what I've been articulating the whole time, amongst other cases which I'm in no position to echo at this juncture, should be all the more reason to track down this game no matter which version floats your boat. My advice? Go with both! Or just stick with the SNES version if you're willing enough, your choice, as they'll only run you close to 30 bucks loose, if possibly less, or in the case of complete and boxed copies, 78 bucks or less for the Super NES, or 40 bucks or less for the Genesis, with the former also being available for the Wii Virtual Console. And as always, trust me, you will not regret it in the least. Until then, this is the one and only Hardcore Retro God proudly signing off.